Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Mills. I'm a senior associate at the Zien Group, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's FS Club webinar where we're going to be discussing to trust or not to trust. This is the question when buying or selling cryptocurrencies. I'm joined by Dr. Eric Brucian, the co founder of Liberus. As always, the agenda for this webinar is very simple. Following my introduction, Ara is going to make his presentation and then we're going to move on to the Q&A discussion. Now, I'm afraid that you are all muted, but you are able to submit your questions to our speakers through the chat tool to the right hand side of your screen. Please do chip in at any point of the proceedings. I'm going to be collating your questions and I will put them to Ara at the end. As with all of our FS Club webinars, we're going to be recording this session. You're going to be able to, th uh, to access Eric's slides and presentation at a later date. But before we move on, I really must thank FS Club members who have opened our webinar to the public. With their help since March of 2020, we've had over 300 of these events on topics as diverse as money laundering, the metaverse and high salinity agriculture. The FS Club is the premier global executive knowledge network for technology and finance, where members and their guests can meet over a glass of wine to debate key issues which impact on financial services, technology and society. It's very much like a 21st century version of the city's 17th century coffee houses. And so, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Arik Bruchian. Ara. Tell us about buying and selling cryptocurrencies. Simon, thank you uh, very much. And um, there we are. So ladies and gentlemen, have a very good morning or good afternoon to you all. And let me start with a, a simple but actually very stunning proposition. It's I think 30,000 US dollars that Bitcoin costs today. About a year ago, or slightly less than that, it reached heights of almost double double of that. About a decade ago, it were, it was worth nothing. So I think that there is a big question that rambles around you know, rooms in uh, trading houses elsewhere on this planet. Like, what is the reason? Why do we trust uh, cryptocurrencies? Why do we entrust our money? Those of us who invest into cryptocurrencies, having an expectation of getting it back if cryptocurrencies are decentralized and unlike the fiat currencies aren't backed by any centralized authority and they are very very um, uh, unpredictable in the dynamics of their price change so that's the question that uh, I'm, I'm going to be um, addressing today and the key to this question is why is it that we trust something that you know is of an intangible uh, nature why do we, why is it that we trust trust it to hold part of our financial needs at least and is it possible that trust in itself is the matter my name is ara Bruzan. for the past 20 years i've been in um uh, open, uh, business of developing and producing open source intelligence and artificial intelligence powered systems my partners and i a couple of years ago started thinking precisely about the question what is it that drives the valuation of, uh, of cryptocurrencies as intangible assets. And today I'm going to be sharing with you the uh, results of our inquiry around which we uh, built a partnership called Liberus. We actually try to understand the driving force behind or forces behind cryptocurrency valuations. We looked into the role that trust has played in that. And we tried, to, we have tried and developed a system of Assessing, uh, assessing trust as a signal of cryptocurrency valuation. I'll start our today's presentation with a fundamental look into what cryptocurrencies are. In order to build our, um, uh, our train of thought, it's important for us to start from fundamentals. I won't get very, uh, any technical. It's not the point of uh, today's meeting. Uh, today, I'll try to just think about the nature, the, if you will, the synthetic nature of cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies in their wider context. From there, we move into the role that trust arguably plays in building the valuation of cryptocurrencies. 
And I'll uh, wrap up today's talk with presenting to you the system that my partners and I built that allows to assess in real time the level of trust for each cryptocurrency and use this as a meaningful signal for decision making. So uh, with this, uh, let me um, move, for, uh, move ahead. Cryptocurrencies obviously are here to stay whether we like it or no. It's their effect of life. Warren Buffett might, might like them, might, might dislike the fact. Uh, Peter Thiel or Elon Musk might like, might like the fact, but in reality, the market cap as of today is at $1.4 trillion. Uh, it used to be double of that in November 2021. It's very volatile, but it's hardly going to be uh, you know, going nowhere. It, we've already recorded a hundred times growth compared to 2017, and the average trading volume of, of Bitcoin only surpassed that of Apple in 2021. Most, more, more, more interestingly, though, there is a not very wide known stat that about half of cryptocurrency traders or uh, investors in cryptocurrencies invested their money in crypto in 2021, according to the Reuters survey, which is a sign that um, there is an, almost an exponential interest in, for, in buying and uh, keeping cryptocurrencies as an asset class. So they are here to stay, but at the same time, the variations of cryptocurrencies are very chaotic or you know, unpredictable. You choose, the, you choose the term. The driving force behind cryptocurrency valuation isn't clear. There are a lot of ideas, there are you know, a lot of arguments, but you know, things like forking of cryptocurrencies, for example, or you know, regulation, all of that doesn't necessarily contribute to the valuation of cryptocurrency to become uh, better understood. Look into Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Litecoin, lots of volatility, and you know, there is obviously a general increase in the variation of cryptocurrencies during the pandemic. But now, during the last year, Again, the logic, the uh, historical valuation is again going in not necessarily under well understood ways. So in order to get into this, let's get look into the fundamentals. What is a cryptocurrency? Again, I, I won't get uh, any technical, more interested in cryptocurrencies in, their, you know, in the virtue of their most fundamental nature. So first argument is that they are obviously intangible assets. We know that cryptocurrencies lack physical essence or you know, an institutional uh, backing party, yet they are expected to add or retain value and they, they are expected to generate benefits. So one thing that probably most of us would agree on axiomatic level is that cryptocurrencies are intangible assets. And you know, moreover, even the technology that fundamentally makes them possible, distributed databases, in the books of the companies, that technology is written under the, under the article of intangible assets. But there's slightly more to that. Cryptocurrencies are nothing more than intangible assets, indeed. Are they a medium of exchange? Well, to an extent, although the point is that you know, there is no obligation to accept cryptocurrencies as a medium of exchange. So no party is compelled or obliged to do so. Are they units of account? Well, they are not cash equivalents per se, and the price volatility makes them not the best candidate, if you will, for, unit, for being a unit of account. Are crypto stores of value, as say Peter Thiel or uh, Elon Musk often argue? They're neither for you know, technical debt or uh, equity securities. And you know, uh, an accountant, I'm not one, but an accountant would probably argue that they are not financial assets. So cryptocurrencies are nothing more than an intangible asset, identifiable non-monetary asset, but without a physical appearance. And that brings us to the key idea. So me and my partners uh, thought that in order to understand or to have at least a better understanding than we used to have of the mechanism behind cryptocurrency valuation, we would need to look in what is what are the approaches, what were the approaches of evaluating or measuring, assessing intangible assets. Now, there are many of these. All of you know about goodwill, about reputation or confidence. Uh, Baruch Lov, uh, from New York University famously argued that for enterprises in the 21st century, up to 85%, you 
of their value would be uh, basi uh, basically the value of an intangible asset measured you know, the, the same way a goodwill would be measured. So, but what we did, we looked into what's fundamental for these uh, for these categories. Confidence, goodwill, or uh, reputation are not necessarily the same. So we tried to look a level deeper, and what appeared for us is that all these big uh, meta categories have a meta meta category that basically is trust. Trust is what uh, what was the engine behind uh, a reputation, let's say, an entity of a cryptocurrency. Trust is what fuels the confidence of one party towards the other. And trust is also what goodwill is predicated on. But uh, let, let's look a bit deeper into trust. Trust is when a party relies to another, willingly in the situation that's not only directed into a future, but where the truster abandons part of control to, to, over trustee's actions. And I should mention here that trustee, the party being trusted, doesn't necessarily need to be a human. All uh, humans, we assign uh, human qualities to technology, to things, that's a well-known fact. The key point about trust is that the properties that we uh, trust in the party that we trust these properties in don't need to either quantitatively or qualitatively correlate with reality. Trust is extremely perception-based. If we break trust, but break trust down, not break trust in general, then we'll see that it has certain key dimensions. Trust is perception-based. Trust is being formed in the perception of the human, of the, of, the, of the individual that trusts somebody or something. Trust is very truster-specific. No two people have the same quality and the same type of trust towards, the, towards let's say, the same third party. Trust is historical and cumulative. History matters, you know, they are, we live with trust and we're yesterday with regards to trust matters today and today will matter tomorrow. Trust is comparative. When we trust a party, when we trust, we trust a human institution or a cryptocurrency, in our head we compare, almost uh, subconsciously, we compare that entity or that cryptocurrency with the other ones. Trust necessarily wants this on the background, the other entities that we uh, that belong to the same class. Trust is mediated and what we mean here is that in a data or information that we perceive and we build our trust based upon, the data in today's world is you, we, you, uh, we receive through mediated channels. Very rarely do we directly observe the party that we decide to trust or not to trust. We live in the age obviously uh, of mass media, of social media, of word of mouth, of networks, and that's how we receive our information about the party that we trust in a mediated way. Finally, trust has unpredictable dynamics. I've just mentioned the historical and cumulative nature of trust, and one might counter argue, how could trust be unpredictable if it builds layer by layer or diminishes layer by layer historically? But the point is that there are uh, constituents of trust that uh, could be bu uh, building up, you know, and not being visible up to certain moment when some kind of a chain reaction start, when we pass a threshold and suddenly trust di tr the trust dynamic changes in a way that you might consider to be unpredictable. So these are the key uh, uh, key dimensions of trust. And they, when me and my partners looked into them, they immediately uh, brought uh, to us a question that is, they are covered in this most worthy trust of this presentation, but we won't go here line by line. And I put this slide only for everybody to consult it later if you choose uh, choose to. So you know, everybody talks about sentiment. We live in the age where you know having a good engine that proprietary engine that would assess a sentiment is already a good business proposition. And as we originally thought that when we talk about trust, we probably talk about sentiment and almost immediately it became clear that it was a threat. These are not the same. Sentiment is a very snapshot, a static snapshot of a general mood. Trust is a dynamic relation. It's a dynamic relation of a truster toward the trustee. Sentiment is a general measure of how, let's say media or you know, social media, present say a cryptocurrency at a certain moment while you know, uh, that, that sentiment, while trust 
is a the model or representation of cumulative perception of a cryptocurrency historical performance. Sentiment measures an output. It's basically contained in the text, in the in the media article, in a tweet. You can look into that, and you know, many people would probably agree that the cryptocurrency has a negative, positive, or neutral sentiment in this particular text. With trust, it's, it's, it's not that at all. Trust actually emerges as a result of an interaction of a given stakeholder with a cryptocurrency related information or a publication. It's a result of dynamic interaction, which gives us a hope that interaction can be modeled. More about this shortly. Sentiment is a short term, it emerges and re-emerges every given day, and it's absolute. Sentiment for a given cryptocurrency doesn't necessarily take into account or uh, the sentiments towards other cryptocurrencies. They are not directly entailed one in the other. While with trust, trust is long-term, historical, and as I've already mentioned, it's very contextual. Trust towards a given cryptocurrency, we found out, necessarily takes into account and is reflected in the trust in the other cryptocurrencies. So when we realize this difference, and when we realize that it's trust that basically is the, back in the day we, thought, we intuitively realized that we're, if we, it trust that the powerhouse behind at least some of the forces behind crypto valuation, then the next immediate question for us was, how do we assess trust? Trust is a communicational construct. It's like, you know, Reputation is like the public opinion. So, and you know, the way public opinion works, the way you measure it, you do a survey. The problem with surveys are, is that the moment you ask the question, the answer is outdated. The, uh, the answers to survey questions are almost necessarily uh, retrospective. We realize that in order for trust to be a meaningful signal, instead of being measured, it should have been modeled. So we needed to come up with a system that would focus on real-time modeling of trust towards different cryptocurrencies. And this modeling would be producing signals that ideally would be very much correlated to the trust picture in the real time, in the real world. I want to emphasize one thing. Modeling implies focusing on you know, what in uh, communication measurement is sometimes referred to as outgrowth pragmatic uh, results of communication interaction with the stakeholder mind. Not output, not simply no square inches, or as they would say in the 20th century, or amount or volume of tweets. There is a difference. Outgrowth is not the same, the same as the output. You know, a tweet by uh, already mentioned Mr. Musk probably matters much more than hundreds of thousands of tweets by people you know, relatively smart, but not with with his reputation or with his uh, his social social weight. So with this idea, we came up with a system. It's basically an open source, and we came up and developed an open source intelligence system that's, uh, that's powered by natural language processing and artificial intelligence. And that monitors, we built this system so that it basically models the process of trust creation uh, in, the, in the heads of people whose opinion matters for crypto valuation. This model is empirical. It's based on the agenda setting model developed in the 1970s, which was also an uh, empirical model measuring how a media agenda becomes public agenda and, their, and uh, subsequently policy agenda. And that's basically how it looks. So if you, if you look into this slide, what you'll see here, is that macroeconomic context, regulatory actions, or other stakeholder actions, so basically real-time events, they are being uh, covered by online traditional media and social media, and there is also an interplay between the two. Cryptocurrency market players form their collective perceptions, as I've already mentioned, as one of the fundamental axioms, mainly by observing the online or traditional media, social media, obviously, through word of mouth very often. And based on this, they form their opinions. They basically, the level of trust towards the given crypto is being continuously formed. That leads to their buy-sell decisions that in their turn affect the valuation of cryptocurrencies. Key to this model is that perceptions are critical for decision-making. 
And our the main challenge was to make sure that we, in this uh, blue box in the very middle, you see the scope of what we've modeled in Liberus. Our key challenge has been to model precisely that, the process of uh, trust formation in the real time. So we, what we needed to do and what we've done was precisely selecting, hand vetting the sources of information that we conjectured and checked and knew were the sources of information that crypto uh, players most often relied on. Then we basically make a, made a judgment about the level of impact of each and every source. We're covering more than 700 online traditional and social media sources. And this coverage is very much heavily weighted differently so that we uh, model the impact on the heads uh, of crypto market players as closely to the real life scenario as possible. We built this model and we ran this model uh, in the shades for probably a couple of years. And what we saw, we saw a very strong correlation between the level of trust for, that we capture through what we call a peace score or a liberal trust score and the outlook, the direction, the directionality of the change of crypto valuation. We do not claim that the two are, uh, that, that there is a uh, clear cause effect link. I don't know, I don't think anybody knows, but that there is certain correlation that, uh, that is for sure, and I'll talk in a bit about the nature of this correlation. But before that, we built that system, we called it Liberus, try to try to capture the idea that you know, being able to make decisions about your crypto uh, assets uh, basically is one of the key ingredients for you being a free person, free individual, being, uh, being free. And we called it Liberus and uh, T-score, hold on please, uh, we develop a T-score, T-score, and we uh, generated live for 13 main cryptocurrencies by market capitalization. You can see it here on this slide. We developed not only the absolute score, but we also developed its dynamics and its outlook. We also uh, have created a dashboard that presents analytics for all ingredients of trust: sentiment, topics, article count, word count, etc. And finally, it so happens that uh, Libras being an insight as a service it actually gives an access to all the original texts and news or online news uh, sources that have been used to generate this trust score. So you can drill down, you can click and you can go and check the original story and think for yourself, understand why is it that the trust for this cryptocurrency goes out, for example, up and down. So we've uh, launched this service uh, a couple of months ago. As of today, it's still available for, for free use. It will be uh, be priced very soon. You can go to liberus.com and check it out. And for uh, financial services members, there will be a privileged access to Liberus. So we'd be very glad to get your feedback or your opinion. I want to show briefly a small use case with Bitcoin energy concerns. You might remember that so it happens almost a year ago, Mr. Musk, which I keep mentioning today quite often, didn't intend to. Mr. Musk actually uh, tweeted that Tesla would suspend vehicle purchases with Bitcoin due to energy use concerns, and that immediately affected the price of Bitcoin. What happened with T-Score, T-Score started declining immediately after the, uh, the, the, the tweet, and it turned negative on May 17th. T-score is a comparative uh, value, so it can be positive, neutral, or negative. While obviously uh, the Bitcoin pr price is an absolute value. And in this uh, visual, you can see how T-score being the blue line started to decline and went negative. And Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin price was basically following or being correlated. We looked into this and the correlation coefficient was Point until 83 with very strong Granger causality starting at the third leg, meaning that uh, after a change in T score, within three hours after that change, Bitcoin price would also change in the same direct, uh, direction with very high uh, direct, uh, direct directionality, so to say. So, with this, uh, I have a, I would I want to stop for a moment and ask. Uh, 
question. Can we just pull the survey question? The question goes like this, based on the, uh, which of the following cryptocurrencies would you invest today in based on whatever information you have now in your head? So let's give it probably about a minute or something before we get the answers. We have Bitcoin, we have Ethereum, Tether, XPR, and Cardano. And in the meantime, while the results of our survey are being read just for the sake of time, and already we have the results, and I can see that Ethereum is the clear leader, leader for, followed by Bitcoin and then Cardano. This morning, I checked uh, the trust scores, and I'll just give you the, the figures that were uh, actual as of probably an hour ago. And uh, Ethereum, uh, XPR actually, and Ethereum would be leading together with Tether. And uh, Bitcoin will, uh, will show the worst result with Cardano being second to worst. So that's interesting to see how you know, the trust yet in the perceptions in the media is probably not necessarily uh, the, the way it immediately appears in our heads. But at the same time, as I said, the uh, correlation that we've seen shows us that trust can be moving in directions we don't necessarily immediately see to be actual, but suddenly in the day or two, that direction becomes also something actual for the price as well. With this, let me move to, uh, to the end of our today's, or at least my part of the presentation. What is trust anyways? Is that the main driver of valuation? I don't really know, frankly. I think that trust is basically a signal. My partners and my work together has shown to us that trust is the, um, you know, it could be approached the same way as Friedrich Hayek almost 70 years ago spoke about prices. Paraphrasing Hayek, you could say that no one part in the crypto market has the full entirety of information that defines the price of cryptocurrencies. But trust acts probably as a numerical index, which can't be derived from this or that property possessed by cryptocurrency. But in its entirety, it reflects what's condensed in the significance of the cryptocurrency. Trust is the signal, I'd say, that condenses essential information about cryptocurrency valuation. There are surely other drivers, probably as important as, as trust is. The only thing that our experience shows is that these um, uh, other factors are entangled with trust and trust is available for us. So measuring trust as a signal for valuation probably gives us at least a better outlook into the other factors that drive cryptocurrency valuation as well. So ladies and gentlemen, I wanna finish my part of the, today's meeting with a Another proposition, trust, trust is beautiful, trust is a beauty, but not necessarily in the intuitive way we think about trust. Trust is also beauty, uh, is, uh, is similar to beauty if we, paraphrase, uh, if we paraphrase a very well-known saying that goes that beauty is no quality of things themselves. It exists merely in the mind which contemplates them and each mind perceives a different beauty, said famously by, by David Hume. And trust or an intangible value is no quality of cryptocurrencies. We argue that it, it exists in the mind of market participants and each participant might perceive it slightly or radically different, but the overall take, the overall signal, the overall trust of market participants can be captured through this very simple signal, trust. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And I'll be very glad to answer your questions. Ari, that was absolutely fascinating and an incredibly topical issue. Um, I can see that we've got a lot of questions from our audience, but as the chairman, uh, the privilege of the first, asking the first one falls to me. Now, I was going to ask you something fairly banal um, about, uh, central banks putting effort into digital fiat currencies and what the implications are for, for, for crypto. But I think that's too boring. Um, I was really taken by what you were saying about trust, but I'm wondering whether trust is the right word 
um, isn't faith the right word? There's this belief in an intangible and invisible asset, and there's belief that your cryptocurrency is the one true faith. Um, do you think faith might be a better comparator? Simon, thank you very much. It's a good question. I have uh, uh, I have answers from two perspectives. So, for, uh, so first of all, um, uh, I and you know, my partners. That so happened that we're not uh, native English speakers. So you know, when non-native English speakers come up with a word or come up with a concept or select a concept that needs to uh, capture something precisely, we don't claim that. Um, I don't claim that trust would precisely be the the term, the concept. Uh, but the second uh, second approach to the answer would be what I like and what we, my partners and I, like in the concept of trust, although one, you might argue that the same probably applies to faith, is that, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to some extent, is that trust implies precisely that, you know, uh, that one party basically uh, giving a, a power of decision-making to the other under conditions of uncertainty. You might argue that faith more or less captures the same process, and you know, I won't argue here, you know, because you know, again, my English is probably not at that level. But I think what's important here is that we're trying to capture precisely this dynamic. A uh, human uh, basically trusting a technology under conditions of uncertainty and not having a full control over what cryptocurrency you know, as an asset class or as a, te a technology-based asset class uh, will be doing in the future. So pro faith might be the, the term, but again, that's the pro both linguistic and conceptual answer to your question. Oh, there's all sorts of, of 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 routes you could run down with that, with you know forks in a in a in a blockchain being heresy, and you know the one true faith and all sorts. So you know, I think <laughs> I'm probably pushing the analogies a bit too far. But trust implies a relationship. Um, yes. We trust in banks because we identify them as as groups of individuals, and we rightly or wrongly, probably very wrongly, feel that we can mediate. Uh, with those banks, we can negotiate with them with when things go wrong. There is nothing like that with 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 cryptocurrencies. What you're actually trusting in is the trustless environment. Um, yeah. So, do you think there is value in this this trust trustless environment? That's a very good question, and probably Simon, a um, uh, key question you know, uh, as far as you know. I'm concerned as much as I've been thinking about it. The key question is, what do we trust? So I've been thinking about this for the past couple of years, right? What is it that we trust in cryptocurrencies? It's not the limited supply because as we can, we could be seeing it's not necessarily limited, right? It's not, uh, uh, you know, we know that uh, decentralization has big advantages in terms of you know, no party being able to fully control that. But to which extent is trust slash material, history has shown that not to a very big extent, right? I think, and it will, might sound totally logical, but I think that what we trust is trust. And that's what the, uh, the signal is predicated on. We're measuring trust. We haven't really been asking what are the reasons for this uh, trust, right? So if today there is a regulation that comes from the left-hand side of this slide, you know, there's more regulatory action. All of we know that European Commission is sitting and thinking about, you know, how to bring more regulation and more consumer protection in the area of cryptocurrencies. Basically what happens is that this regulatory action will translate in this or that way into a trust signal. So in a way, uh, you know, as far as uh, modeling trust and producing uh, forward-looking outlook is concerned, the task is simple. We, we assess trust and we trust that trust, excuse my tautology, but we trust that trust is a meaningful signal for uh, thinking about the future valuation of cryptocurrency. But why it is so? Why is it that we trust it? You know, we're, in the end of the day, we're very human and very many decisions don't necessarily boil down to rational, uh, to rational justifications. So my answer is, I don't know whether I necessarily need to know to make this signal more, uh, more meaningful. 
I'm not that sure. But fungibility is a, a, a very important issue, whether exchange restrictions and people are unable to convert cryptocurrency into, into fiat currency, that must have a, a, a very severe impact. Oh yeah, absolutely. You see, uh, and that again, that would come uh, very um, comfortably for the system, but and very adequately from the left hand side of this slide. So, you know, changes in macroeconomic context or change, changes into regulatory actions, other stakeholder actions, there is real life and that real life happens you know, somewhere, right? Even in this mediated age. And uh, all of these actions will translate into into media coverage, into social media coverage, they will be tweeted. And uh, you know, as for as long as the reality is that we being very busy decision makers, base our decisions on mediated information, that's where basically trust modeling, uh, trust modeling happens. And now, if you remember, a... sorry, Ari, Ari, we keep going on. If you remember, uh, just one last point, I think the same applied to media agenda theory, right? Whatever really happened in the real world would need to be translated into media agenda to uh, trigger changes into public and policy agenda. So that's probably good or bad, depending on the context, but that is the reality. We live in a mediated world and that's, the, uh, that's, the, that, that's what has allowed us to build this, this system so that we model perceptions and trust as they appear while decision makers immerse themselves with mediated information. Absolutely. And of course, you get validation from governments as well. I mean, you said that the crypto are not financial assets, but tax authorities mm -hmm. might well disagree. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's a very good uh, question you, you're asking. I was actually expecting somebody from the audience you know, to call me out on this. So it's good you've done that. Uh, obviously, you see, uh, it's uh, there is a big, I would say, almost ontological confusion around cryptos. You know, if you're, you're in this webinar, obviously you're interested, so you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, governments want to uh, classify cryptos as financial assets in order for them to be taxed. Some other players don't want them to be qualified like that. You know, my argument was based not on some final truth, I just you know, I just mentioned I'm not an accountant. I just quoted the, probably the most one of the most recent technical papers from ACCA because I wouldn't take the courage of you know giving a definition to a crypto. But that doesn't make uh, my proposition the right one. What actually I'm trying to say is that there is so much definitional chaos around cryptos today, right? That basically doesn't make uh, a big difference yet, at least yet who, uh, you know, which party thinks what kind of an asset they are. The, on the safest level, they are still intangible assets. And that's what the system is predicated on. Uh, since trust is perception-based and indiv individual, do you actually factor confirmation bias into your, into your model? Yeah, we did. So the model is uh, very much, um, uh, uh, communication aligned by training a communicational scientist. And what we've tried to do in the models, I won't get now into the debris of that, but what we've tried to ensure, so we've put their checks and balances for confirmation bias, we've put their checks and balances for the, um, uh, that basically allow us uh, to model trust, taking into the account how stories feed back into other stories and stories amplify each other and, or, you know, how stories develop the message that is probably the most expected message in the market. So we've put all the checks and balances on the algorithmical level. And the, the goal wasn't to come to some level of objective trust. Now, as you ladies and gentlemen might be probably capturing from this presentation, I don't believe that there is such thing as an objective trust. The whole idea was to be able to capture trust as it appears in the heads of relevant market players, crypto cryptocurrency traders, so, you know, decision makers, individual crypto players. I mean, we basically almost surveyed and models what are the sources that they base their judgment on and we, be, uh, we build the model around those news or social media sources. And yes, we've tried to put the checks and balances around the same confirmation bias, but just to make sure that not, not that we kind of come up with some objective picture of how cryptocurrencies 
uh, are presented by the media. This objective picture wouldn't be useful for decision making. Making no, we're modeling the subjective picture that would be appearing in the consumers in the text consumers' mind. It, What's it's different? A, What's different about the cryptocurrency market? I mean, doesn't trust also correlate with with stock prices as well? Why is crypto different in this regard? Is it just because it's new and you've got a lot more naive investors involved, or is there something actually beyond that? Oh yes, absolutely. It's new. There are many uh, naive investors, or even the non-naive investors, are still learning very much, I think, to navigate the cryptocurrency market. So that obviously plays its role. I think uh, the big uh, element and what makes crypto very specific, not only cryptocurrencies, you know, uh, non-fungible tokens, for example, is the nature of them being uh, only and only intangible assets. You know, in stock market, um, you know, uh, a brand of a company, the company stock is obviously uh, uh, affected by the uh, intangible value, part of the intangible value of its valuation. So it's not new, it's been around for decades, right? But when we talk about cryptocurrencies, we talk about, in, and that's the one of the main points of this presentation, we talk about intangible assets and only intangible assets. And that makes cryptocurrencies, I suppose, different from, from and cryptocurrency market, different from the stock market. There's a lot more blind faith involved, I think. Oh, absolutely. I think Ginger Baker and Eric Clapton and Steve Winwood would completely agree. A lot of blind faith here, but uh, that's what we're, my partners and I see our mission to uh, kind of translate this blind faith into not ne necessarily uh, fully explained, but at least rational trust, which brings me, Simon, back to the point you made, difference between faith and trust. Now with blind faith, it makes more sense. Uh, right, I've got a, a couple of specific points here. Um, what do you mean by outgrowth versus outcome? That's a, uh, that's a good question. So uh, I didn't use the term outcome, I used two other terms, output and the outtake. And let me explain. Uh, an output would be an amount of tweets, let's say, about Ada and Cardano. Uh, outtake would be how many of those tweets would be, let's say, retweeted. So there is already a pragmatic implication for, say, having uh, 5,000 tweets, for example, in one day, and let's say 1,000 is retweeted. Outgrowth would be the, uh, the action, the, basically the change in the mind frame of a trader, let's say, or for a player of a cryptocurrency market who reads the tweet is the behavioral or attitudinal change. And uh, it's quite easy to achieve an, out, you know, an output, you just tweet and tweet. An outtake is a bit harder because here, you know, uh, if somebody retweets, it means that it at least signifies a certain level of engagement. It could be a negative engagement, I might retweet and disagree. But all growth, meaning I've taken an action based on this tweet, is the pragmatic implication. And uh, one of our main points, one of our, the main strengths of Liberus is that we basically, you can't measure outgrowth. You can't go and you know, ask people, did you make this call based on this tweet or this you know, news media story? But uh, what we do, we, uh, we model outgrowth, what, uh, what this uh, bla uh, uh, blue box in the middle does, and that blue box signifies our open source intelligence, NLP and AI systems, this basically will model the possible outgrowth, the possible mind frame or attitude of uh, cryptocurrency players, and we signify it in the trust signal. We don't say that that signal again will push the price up and down. We just say there is a correlation. The nature of this correlation is very complex, but trust seems to be very strongly entangled with other elements that are responsible for the variation change. I hope I've Excellent. answered the question. You've, you've certainly answered the question. Eric, thank you so much for that. Uh, I can just see Ian Harris is uh, saying hello and passing on his regards. So uh, oh, just a, a cheeky hello to Ian. Um, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, that we have come to the uh, end of our time together. 
Uh, I can see that we've still got a few questions left. Don't worry, we will pass them on to uh, Eric and he will get back to you uh, directly. Um, please do contact, uh, contact us to, to continue this discussion. If, if you email us uh, any other questions you've got, we can, we can certainly pass, uh, pass them on. Just remains for me to thank uh, the FS Club for making today possible. I'd also urge you to keep your eye on our forthcoming events page for more webinars uh, and other events, which include the FS Club Spring Garden Party on uh, Wednesday the 11th of May, uh, the Employee Share Schemes and Trustees Conference on the 13th of May, and a City of London event on climate change and sustainability on the 18th of May. You can catch up with all of our previous webinars on YouTube or our new Pizzazz TV channel. Uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Eric, thank you so much for a, a fascinating and engaging presentation. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting. Goodbye.